I'm Alex Berman, and you're watching Selling Breakdowns. Let's start today with a game. You ready? So, you need to think of a product. The more random, the better. Now, Google it, but at the end, add the word reviewed. You win the game if the first entry on Google isn't an affiliate marketing site. How do you tell if it's affiliate marketing? Well, when you click any of the Buy Now links, you'll be redirected to a retailer, probably Amazon. In the web address, you'll find a short part of the code that says tag equals, followed by a username that probably resembles the review site. Let me show you. Google romance novels reviewed. Here we are, rtbookreviews.com. Let's pick the first book that's featured and here, buy now on Amazon. And here you see the address tag equals romantic times. If it's not Amazon, then you might see something like AFF equals or even affiliate equals. Let's try again. Chicken Coop reviewed. First entry, first review. Scroll down to click here and there we go. Affiliated. Give it a go yourself and let us know in the comments if you find any winning searches. Okay, now what's the point we're trying to make here? Well, almost every niche site has a review site and that site makes money from the sale of those products. In many cases, the site exists only to cater to that niche. In other cases, you might find established names like CNET or Good Housekeeping or something else, but they're still making money on any of their audience who click their link and buy that product. Actually, that's not true. They make money if you click that link and buy any product, whether it was the one they reviewed or not. So the question is, can you trust reviews when the reviewers are making money on the sale of those products? Today, we're gonna to see how deep the affiliate rabbit hole goes. We'll also see how customer reviews are being manipulated, how social psychology alters the effectiveness of star ratings in Uber and Airbnb, and how review aggregation sites like Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes are no longer passive. They are affecting the products that are being created. Okay, let's go back to affiliate marketing. A few weeks back, a journalist called David Zacks wrote a brilliant article about the billion dollar online mattress industry and the power struggle between the big retailers and the top ranking review sites. I'll put a link to the article in the description. It's long, but really worth a read. In it, he estimates that the big mattress reviewers are making millions of dollars through affiliate programs and the offer of better percentages for good reviews has created massive lawsuits. Because a review on the top ranked sites for a mattress brand can literally be the difference between total failure and tens of millions in revenue. With online product sales, the review is absolute king. Derek Hales ran one site called Sleepopolis and it featured a review of a brand called Lisa. That review generated 18% of Lisa's $80 million in sales. And while the going rate is about 5% in a lot of affiliate marketing, like mattresses and Amazon, you know for sure that some brands are going to offer more in the hope of a positive word on their product. The regulations around this are weak, and although sites may disclose that they're affiliates, they almost never say which brands are paying them which rates. Even if it's all Amazon links, that doesn't mean the rates are fixed. Video game downloads get a higher rate than electronics, so better to sell an Xbox game than an Xbox controller. Also, if one product is sold well from an affiliate, they'll often get a higher rate, so it's unlikely they'll displace their top seller review, even if they find a better product in real life. Now, I'm not saying that every affiliate marketer is dishonest, not at all, but the entire system's geared towards dishonesty because reviews are only trustworthy if they have no bias and affiliate marketing absolutely builds bias. All right, so review sites are out. What about customer reviews? They're not making any money in this setup, so we can trust them, right? Well, yes, in theory, but did you actually meet those customers or did you just see what they wrote on Yelp or Amazon? When looking at these supposedly authentic reviews, British newspaper The Guardian, quote, uncovered fake reviewing on almost an industrial scale. They found that young computer scientists from Bangladesh, India, and Indonesia were being employed by many Western businesses to drastically improve their online ratings. These guys use a range of VPNs, proxies, and other tricks to get around the usual limits on IP addresses enabling them to add a wall of good reviews to any client who pays them. It's not hard to find them either. Just post a job on Fiverr or Freelancer or Upwork asking to boost your business's rating and you'll get plenty of applications. Amazon tried to crack down in 2015, suing over 1,000 of these scam reviewers, but this didn't fix the problem. 
Now they call themselves list optimization or something similar. And rather than using tech to get around the problem, they simply have a huge contact list of low paid reviewers who will go where they're told. It gets worse too. In August, Business Insider reported on a University of Chicago research team who created an AI that could post fake reviews that were basically undetectable. But anyone can leave a review on Amazon or Yelp, regardless of whether they actually use the product or service. What about Uber and Airbnb, where you really have to be a true customer to write the review? Well, now you have a new problem, guilt. Ethan Wolfman discussed this in a great article on time.com last year. Link to that below too. He points out that almost all Uber drivers have a 4.6 star review or higher, and any driver dipping below that is in danger of being fired. So if 4.5 out of 5 is under the Uber level, doesn't this make the whole system basically meaningless? Your Uber experience is pretty simple. If the driver arrives on time, gets you there safely, and isn't rude, then anything less than a 5 feels unfair, since they did nothing wrong. And if they do mess up, then often it's something that really annoys you, so you'll probably give a one or a two. Airbnb faces a different issue. First, you often have more interaction with the host, sometimes having a coffee together or even a quick tour of the area. This means guilt will push you to give a better review than you should have. Imagine you were buying a house. Even with a big budget, do you think you'd say 75% of the properties you looked at were five star? No chance. Also with Airbnb, you're aware that a strong negative review will be visible to other hosts who may think you're not worth the trouble as a fussy guest. Finally, let's talk about games and movies. Two similar-ish products who have always had a strong relationship with the reviewers and critics. When reviews were mostly in papers and magazines, fans would develop an understanding of these critics and be able to get a fair gauge of how they themselves would like a film or game from these reviews, even if that didn't always agree with what the reviewer said, because they know the reviewer's taste. Sure, there were also issues of favorable reviews being given in exchange for exclusive access, like tours of the set or early plays of the game, but there was at least a relationship built between reviewers and fans, an understanding of sorts. Then came the aggregation sites, particularly Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes. By turning every review into a score or a positive or negative, they removed the value and nuance of the actual content of the reviews. These sites now wield huge power. Metacritic reviews are often used as a way to calculate bonus payments to staff in gaming or the payment from a game publisher to the developer. So they will only get a higher fee if they get an 80% average, for example. If you know this, as a game developer, are you really gonna take risks that might alienate some fans but could really excite others? Probably not. You're gonna work towards mass appeal. Same in the movie industry. It's not by accident that studios have become more and more risk averse, sticking to familiar old franchises. With a Marvel Universe film, for example, the studio knows that if they get a bad Rotten Tomatoes score, they at least have an established audience already. Otherwise, that green splat would kill the film dead, like it did recently with Baywatch. So can you trust reviews? Overall, I've got to say, no, you can't. But that's really an overview of these industries as a whole. There are plenty of great, honest reviewers out there but you have to read carefully to find them. The best advice I can give is ignore ratings, look for details. If you want a comfortable Airbnb, look for what people have said about the bed and the heating. If you want a new washing machine, find people who talk in years, not days, because they probably really had the product. Analyzing reviews is a whole skill of its own. Maybe we need a review site of review sites. We could call it Metacritic. I wonder what I could charge reviewers for that. Want to learn more about business theory and history? Be sure to like and subscribe to be notified of our next segment.